Next up, we have Liz Posse Corthell, who is a phenomenal experienced strategist at MadPow. And she's going to be joined by Woodrow W. Winchester III, who is the graduate program director for professional engineering programs at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. They are going to discuss futures thinking, which is a toolkit and mindset for envisioning various potential futures, including the ones that could make the most impact. I'm so fascinated by futures thinking, and I know you will be too. So please take it away, Liz and Woodrow. Awesome. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Amy. Um, so we are so excited to be talking to you about futures thinking today. Um, and I kind of want to start off by, uh, you know, defining how we think about futures thinking and, and what definitions we both use. Um, so my, my definition that I like to use comes from Dr. Sohal Anayatola, who's a renowned futurist who says, with futures thinking, we use the future to change the present. What about you, Woodrow? Yeah, Liz, um, this is really intriguing because I'm just so excited um, because futures thinking has such prominence in uh, the conversations um, through this conference. And this is just, it just really speaks to the notion of, and the powers Amy's kind of articulated in terms of, and the potential and possibilities of futures thinking. I would concur, you know, with, with your definition of futures thinking. And, you know, as Amy kind of suggested, you know, it really kind of represents this sort of um, toolbox, skill set, sensibilities, a way of thinking um, is one way that I really kind of kind of encapsulate what futures thinking is all about. And specifically our conversation today, which I'm really um, excited to, to kind of begin that sort of exploration uh, with a specific tool or technique, and that's um, vision concepting. Yeah, but on the topic of vision concepts, let's go ahead and bring up the slides because I want to see some examples of it so we can uh, share with the audience here today. All right, I'm having a little trouble with um, the screen that I'm seeing. So let me know if you are seeing those slides, Woodrow. Yeah, you know what, Liz, having a little bit of a issue as well. I don't see the slides. All right. Okay. All right. Well, if the slides are up, then we can still talk about them. Oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. Okay, I can see oh, everything nice. now. <laughs> I can see clearly now the rain is gone. All right. There you go. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about vision concepts. So how do you define them and how might an organization start to use them? Yeah, Liz. Um, so this is really interesting and we can kind of use these slides as kind of a framework for kind of discussing um, vision concepts. Because again, it's just one tool or technique within the futures thinking um, kind of toolbox that exists um, that we can actually leverage. And when I say we, um, actual designers of technologies or interventions, um, a specific technique that we can actually you know, engage um, with. So when we talk about it and, and the way that I kind of look at um, vision concepts, um, it's creation of these design sort of artifacts it gives the, the designer the ability to kind of experiment without marketplace constraints, um, define new creative limits and break boundaries um, regarding pr um, product design. And we kind of see this illustrated in these two examples from Reebok, um, which I think are pretty interesting and intriguing, which really kind of bring that notion to life. Um, they're typically more, you know, to, to foster, you know, thought, a, to catalyze thought and, and discussion, you know, around a particular sort of design trajectory. And that's what these kind of uh, accomplish in that regard. They're not actual designs that we would, you know, go into market with per se, but they give us um, some, some push in terms of some possibilities that potentially we might would like to explore within a given sort of uh, product. Yeah, they're really evocative and emotional and kind of provoke a response, which I want to show this other example, which kind of rethinks public service. So beyond thinking about, um, you know, the police force and how we protect our communities, this shows some new versions of 
what the future of public service could look like. So we see people distributing food or um, people solving crimes who are retired. Uh, so what I love about this is it's both like artistically engaging. It's really lovely to look at, but it's psychologically engaging. It really challenges the way we think about things, the way we think about systems as they're designed today and how we could think away and break away from what the constraints of today are into the future. Oh yeah, I would totally agree, Liz. And that's what I find very, again, kind of um, provocative about um, this set of, of images and what um, this artist was trying to accomplish. Um, this was coming out of um, this whole notion of defunding the police. So this became a way, you know, it was kind of esoteric and people really were grappling, some people were grappling in terms of getting their hands around it and truly understanding what this concept meant and, and what could be realized out of this whole notion or philosophy of defunding the police. And that's what Ezra did, you know, with this series of images to really kind of bring to life, start the, the conversation um, and, and ultimately build some shared vision around, you know, an alternative to policing. So as you've articulated in terms of public safety, so policing as public safety, you know, what that could potentially look like. And that's the beauty of vision concepts. Um, I think one of the, the beautiful aspects of them, there are quite, quite a few of them, and, and we've kind of talked about that a little bit, but really, you know, providing a way by which to elucidate, um, you know, a, a concept and really kind of share that vision. Yeah, I think that part of the struggle that people find about futures thinking is that it's really hard to imagine alternatives. It's easy yeah. to think about the systems we have today and what they might look like if they continue in the future, because that's kind of been, you know, business as usual. But thinking about alternatives and challenging the version of the future that we are creating today, creating something brand new is a lot more challenging. So I think something like this really helps kind of shake up what that vision of the future could be. Oh, oh, truly, you know, to say the least. So not only, you know, kind of pushing the envelope in terms of, you know, those sorts of possibilities. Um, and, and I like the way you articulated that really kind of pushing the boundaries. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I know we are as we look at different lenses by which we can engage to actually, you know, enact and envision those possible sorts of futures. But what it also does, which which I find very fa fascinating as well, and what um, the work from a research sort of perspective in terms of what I'm doing is, what could these concepts offer in terms of helping us, you know, with the current with current sort of design? So integrating this sort of thinking and the development and design of these sorts of concepts within our new product development processes and practices. And what oftentimes these sorts of vision concepts engender, not only pushing the envelope in terms of, you know, potential possibilities, um, in terms of incorporating maybe different sorts of technologies, but also, you know, where we may need to dig a little deeper in terms of design research. So really helping us to understand where we can go deeper in terms of understanding user or stakeholder, and more specifically, oftentimes, especially in the work um, that we do from a health perspective, and it was interesting, I saw a, a, a message in, in the chat um, or question um, when uh, uh, Dr. Gupta was talking, and that's context of use. So content, the criticality of context, you know, I, I, I can't state that more, uh, but oftentimes what vision concepts afford is thoughts around, well, well, maybe did, did we look at the potential in, in this specific sort of context or what this kind of elucidates is, you know, that we may need to better, there are other stakeholders that maybe we haven't thought about that mm -hmm. may have a, a critical sort of role or influence in terms of, you know, if it's a health change um, sort of technology in terms of behavioral change, or are there other factors um, that exist that kind of influence that at this point, you know, really hadn't considered, but this vision concept really kind of brings to life um, the, the value of those additional sorts of considerations in the design of a more impactful sort of solution. Right. And yeah, Dr. Anayatola was uh, talking about doing a futures thinking conference or a, a workshop and having protesters outside. And instead of, you know, being frustrated or sad that there are protesters, he invited them in because it's crucial to get that uh, opposing structure is thinking about 
who haven't we listened to and who haven't we thought about? Um, and I think that that's really something that Futures Thinking opens the opportunities to do when we get the right people in the room. When we get, oh, Liz, uh, I, I love the way that you just stated that. And that and that is so true. And oftentimes what the vision concept can afford is thoughts around, again, this catalyst for more, I, I think ultimately can to sum up the power of vision concepts. It's, it's just, you know, the thinking increasing in the depth of our thinking, our design thinking, you know, is really there. And it kind of fosters those thoughts around, you know, who are we centering, you know, in the design narrative? You know, who are we including? And as you've articulated, who are we excluding? So yes, totally agree. Yeah, and I wanna get your reaction to another vision concept here. It's a little more tech centric. So I wanted to show this one too. Um, so this is a vision concept for the ambulance of the future, you know, a driverless car, something more compact, something that has the opportunity to get someone injured to the hospital quicker. Um, you know, how do we think about these technologies in the future and how they might be best human centered? Oh yeah, I, I love this image and, and thanks for, uh, for sharing this one. Um, this is really provocative because it really speaks to a, a, another I feel kind of uh, value that vision concepts can actually offer, particularly when we talk about integrating the design of these sorts of or creation of these sorts of artifacts within, you know, current new product development sort of, you know, life cycles or, or practices or processes um, really helps us to begin to kind of think about reframing, you know, at, at the core, the design narrative in terms of how we're looking at you know, the solution? Are there other ways that, you know, it can be looked at, you know, you know, especially when you talk about more traditional sorts of technologies like an ambulance, you know, we have, as you articulated earlier, you know, kind of these preconceived notions, these assumptions of what this technology is, what it should afford. But, you know, by kind of creating these sorts of artifacts that do kind of push the envelope, um, encompass a different sort of perspective, framed by different sorts of, you know, kind of assumptions really can kind of challenge those conventions and really help us to think about, you know, other sorts of possibilities and what other sorts of uh, not only possibilities, but how can I say this? Uh, don't want to necessarily say solutions per se, but, but again, different yeah, ways by which alternative exactly that you know that this could actually be per perspective or viewpoint that this could actually be uh um could be viewed under so yeah I, I love this and it and you know it's really interesting as well and we've had some conversation about this um um uh, as well in terms of you know how these have been used you know to ultimately inform you know, current sort of technologies or products. And we're beginning to kind of see, you know, kind of illustrations of that. And, and I would offer probably there are aspects of this particular vision concept that we're looking at now that are probably going into, especially as we look at, you know, more autonomous sorts of vehicles and what that could kind of afford, you know, this kind of framing the future of, you know, an ambulance or emergency response sort of vehicle. Yeah, that's awesome. I do want to talk more about some some lenses we can use to kind of frame how we think about futures thinking. So I want to talk to you about Afrofuturism. Um, how would you define it? How can we start using it as a design lens? Um, how are ways we can engage with Afrofuturism? Oh, thank you for this, Liz. And this is, you know, while I wore my Marvel shirt, Black Panther, Afrofuturism, <laughs> uh, really uh, depicted in uh, in, in, that, in that movie. Um, so, you know, it's it's really interesting. So Afrofuturism, and that really was kind of what got me kind of intrigued by futures thinking in general, and then more specifically in terms of specific sorts of tools and techniques such as vision concepts and how they could be utilized, you know, in real product development. So it was kind of fueled by um, the movie Black Panther, truly. And it That's just awesome. it just brought light. I, I tell you, it was just amazing. And it's just been amazing to really to see how it has impacted a lot of folk in terms of, you know, providing, as you've articulated, this different sorts of lens by, uh, lens by which can look at, at different things for us 
more from a technological or medical device design sort of perspective, but a lens by which to look at, you know, public policy, to look at governance, um, you know, and, and, and so many different sorts of um, uh, societal um, challenges. But if, to define, to your question, to define Afrofuturism, lots of definitions that are kind of floating around out there. Uh, but I do want to, for those that are um, new to Afrofuturism, it was coined by Mark Derry in his 1994 essay, Black to the Future. Um, so this particular image that we're looking at now um, around Afrofuturism is coming from Yatasha Womack, her book, and she defines it as an intersection of imagination, technology, the future, and liberation, both an artistic aesthetic and a framework for critical theory. Afrofuturism combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, Afrocentricity, and magic realism with non-Western um, beliefs. So in essence, <laughs> and, and the way that she kind of wraps this up is she generally defines Afrofuturism as a way of imagining possible futures through a Black cultural lens. And, you know, what's interesting and what Black Panther really kind of brought to life is Afrofuturism is not just an aesthetic. You know, it's just as much a framework for activism as we just kind of talked about in terms of it being a lens to, to be that can be used to look at and view different sorts of challenges that are facing society. Um, but also imagining to new technologies. And that's kind of where I'm going with kind of engaging Afrofuturism as a lens um, uh, for design and specifically creating vision concepts, utilizing Afrofuturism um, to look at technologies through, through a black cultural sort of lens. So what we have up kind of, and next to this particular image around Afrofuturism, as, as we begin to kind of talk about, you know, the how, so how we can actually leverage that in design. Um, so what this kind of represents, uh, we pulled together this kind of taxonomy, which really kind of looked at some current sort of design practices that are more inclusive and what I would coin as consequential in nature, which kind of challenged the designer to think more inclusively and consequentially, and one of which is equity X design. So incorporated within equity X design are these constructs that we see in yellow here. And one of those is for C. And it really, in terms of this technique actually being employed, um, really challenges the designer to kind of think, you know, future forward and, and think consequentially in terms of the implications of their design decision making. And what we're offering and some of the work that we're beginning to, uh, to kind of now closing the loop in terms of developing some real world sort of concepts is kind of utilizing Afrofuturism to inform these vision concepts um, to then kind of ultimately inform uh, more inclusive and again, what we coin kind of consequential um, um, wearable health technologies. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm so excited to hear about Afrofuturism. And I'm kind of curious, like, with the consequences, how do we think about unintended consequences and how they come up? You know, I, I know that Netflix just released the uh, Coded Bias oh. documentary talking about how facial recognition software has discriminatory code. So how do we think about unintended consequences through Afrofuturism? Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that question, Liz. And you know, that's that's something that we're grappling with and something that we're beginning to kind of, you know, explore. You know, there's some anecdotal evidence in terms of what we've been able to do with connected fitness technologies um, and kind of recentering the design of those. And it really kind of ties to um, kind of our keynote today in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, how we can encourage folks. Um, to, to kind of think about health from a wellness sort of perspective. So these more wellness oriented sort of behaviors and specifically the work that we were doing, encouraging, you know, increased physical activity amongst um, black women um, and kind of wearable tech at this point is kind of let women, black women down um, in, in, in essence. And there's some interesting, not only from, you know, the, the, the optical sensor perspective in terms of challenges, you know, especially when we talk about, you know, heart rate and how it's currently being inferred, utilizing some of these sorts of technologies, the error rates with dark skin, we've seen that with pulse oximeters, you know, here in the, the COVID era, um, the, 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 you know, the accuracy issues with people with dark skin. Um, so, you know, 
back to your question, kind of recentering. So if we centered the design of those sorts of technologies, you know, around, you know, black females, what could that possibly afford in terms of, you know, technology um, and the possibilities of these sorts of technologies? Um, so to your unattended consequence sort of perspective, so kind of talked about, you know, this notion of exclusion. So, you know, we see the implications of that. And as we kind of do the vision concepting and kind of craft and, and develop these sorts of concepts, that provoking more questions, you know, around, you know, the, the centering, a, a, a additional sorts of needs for understanding of, you know, of, of context, the implications of our design decisions, the implications of deploying these sorts of technologies in different sorts of, you know, situations and contexts, you know, begin to kind of elucidate and help us begin to kind of identify what these possible unattended consequences, you know, could be. And now I say that to say this, you know, we're not going <laughs> to, unfortunately, <laughs> Can't figure them all out, <laughs> but 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 the, the but the beauty of this, again, in terms of, of vision concepting and creating these sorts of vision concepts, is increasing you know the depth and the breadth of the thinking you know within the design you know process. So you know that's that's what it's kind of offering, and hopefully, you know we we can address those sorts of unattended sort of uh, consequences, you know, that, that that we're seeing played out in current deployments of, of technology. So, totally. so yeah, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer, but, you know, I think futures thinking becomes one of those sorts of sensibilities or, or, or skills or competencies um, that we as designers can actually engage with to begin to, you know, ask those sorts of questions and back to your, your your point around you know not only who are we including but who's at the design table as well begin to elucidate well not only who we're excluding but who are we excluding in terms of perspective you know around mm -hmm. you know this particular sort of you know design um engagement or narrative so i, I think you know it, it, it provides a, a means by which to kind of facilitate again you know more inclusive sort of design thinking and practices. Totally. And I think we're at time here, but I do want to let the audience know we have a bunch of resources that we've included at the end of our deck, um, some tools you can use, some different things you can use to engage these different parts of inclusive design and inclusive futures thinking. Um, so this will be available uh, to download. But yeah, thank you so much, Woodrow. This has been incredible. I really learned so much every time I talk to you, so I appreciate oh, it. Yeah. I so enjoy this and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. So again, futures thinking, uh, one of those sensibilities along with and systems thinking as well. And I, and I think there's going to be a couple sessions that really kind of address that too. these sorts of thinking competencies that I think that that COVID has really kind of brought to life that we need to better embrace and utilize in design. Totally. It's been totally. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz and Woodrow. I'm a big fan of this work, and I'm looking forward to seeing what kinds of futures our collective here gathered at the conference today is going to bring to life.